So I'm going live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavnis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavnis. Our guest today is J Jacob Glenn. Jacob, are you ready to be great today? I am. Jacob is a dy dynamic technical leader with a career defined by more than 20 years of operational excellence and technical leadership. As a founder and managing director of MGenio Inc., Jacob has responsibility for overall execution of company strategy, including organizational structure, business model development, team leadership, and technology delivery. MGenio is a boutique software development firm delivering high quality solutions for clients ranging from startups to Fortune 500 and everything between. Jacob, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me, Jason. So, Jacob, um, of course, you know, I think if you come now, you got to have some kind of software platform, kind of staff, software delivery system, right? But what are companies still getting wrong about leveraging software? What do they get wrong? So, you know, I think that there's a number of things. I think uh, it depends on what they're trying to do, right? So when you're trying to put software out as, as a product, um, I think one of the things that a lot of companies get wrong is they overcomplicate it. Um, you can do so much with technology and with software that it's easy to like want to pile in features and kind of be lose, lose um, that focus of what is the core promise. And so then you overwhelm your users and they don't necessarily find the value that you want them to because you've overcomplicated things um, because you had too many options versus kind of getting a really a uh, specific focus and delivering on a, on a single promise first and then adding features over time. So how often companies get this wrong? Like they'll, like, they'll, like, they'll, like, they'll, they'll purchase like a software solution, but there's no, like you said recently, like there's no thought to the implementation, right? How much the disconnect is that? Yeah, so I think, you know, so what I was talking about is if, if someone's putting out a product, right? Whether that's a, a physical product with a software component or a software product like software as a service, um, but similarly, when, when you're, when you're bringing something in house, uh, to like help run your business and, and, and kind of create operational efficiency, you have similar, uh, issues where the software, you know, can be optimized for, for your processes. And so I think in, in internal, um, solutions, people buy something off the shelf. They don't, they either don't take the time to optimize it to their own processes and then it doesn't get the use that it should, um, or they they try to go too far and go beyond their processes and have like some perfect world scenario, and then they miss some of the things that make their processes unique. So, Jake, what are you seeing? Do most companies that's like you know buy the first thing they see, or they actually do research and are they going to research on several different products and vendors, or they's like, here's the first thing I see, and we're going to go with this. What's been your experience with that? I think in general, there, there, there's research done. Um, I think most places tend to congregate around the kind of, uh, you know, larger players in the market, right? So, uh, you know, when you talk about, for example, CRM solutions, salesforce.com is by far the largest player. And so they will, you know, a lot of people go with that because and when they go do the research, that's there's so many people on salesforce.com that that's what they choose. And so you have some of that, that kind of, uh, it's not the first thing they see necessarily. They are trying to do the research, but they go with the big player. And you see where they just, just bought Slack, about to buy Slack, like $27 billion or something <laughs> crazy like that. Yeah, yeah, their stock is tanking because of that. Yeah. So when, when a company like is about to buy software, is, is it, have you seen like usually this the IT department does everything or is it a collaboration between IT, marketing, business, or what's been your experience with that and how should it be done? Yeah, I think it really depends on the organization and how big they are. Um, you know, a lot of what we do is custom software development. So we are, uh, you know, someone that will come in and develop custom software for someone. Um, and so they have to, um, uh, really, you know, want to do something unique if they're leveraging us versus um, uh, most of the time anyways, uh, versus, you know, is it, it's an IT purchase of something or um, a marketing purchase of something. I, you know, we've worked with a lot of different organizations of all different sizes. And sometimes it's just the politics of that organization and who, who has the final say is really what drives the answer to that question. That's a very good point. 
So change the subject just a little bit. You, I believe you're, you're an advisory board member for like two or three companies. Can you tell you tell me tell us how that came about? How you, how the opportunity came to be an advisory board member, and what's the benefit for you for you and your company to do that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so so I've I've played an advisory board role um, for a couple companies as well as as for some nonprofits, and um, I kind of view that personally as a way to give back, uh, share my experience, kind of help uh, some other folks, you know, hopefully be successful. Um, you know, and those have come around a couple of different ways. Um, years ago, I went through a kind of a board training and, and that connected to me my first opportunity. Um, and then, you know, um, being in the entrepreneurial community here locally, that has also exposed me to some places where, you know, I, uh, um, someone's, you know, starting a company, they talk to someone who's like, oh, you should talk to Jacob, uh, you know, and I, I talk to them and maybe, Maybe they come to talk to me initially about like kind of what we do or they need some help with software, but um, it's not necessarily a fit, but, but they, you know, we have a connection. It, a lot of times uh, an advisory board role, is, it's really valuable to have a, a personal connection with, with the person who you're kind of advising. And so um, that chemistry is an important component, but a lot of times that's how it comes about. It's kind of organic in, in nature. Um, but that role is, is most of the time, it's just, hey, hey, based on your experience, what advice do you have? We have these problems, right? And it's really a way to um, hear the problem, say, oh, you know, we've experienced that, you know, in this scenario, and here's how we would address it. Or, um, hey, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but here's what, what I would do if it were me, take it or leave it, right? So that kind of stuff. So Jake, what, what's the time commitment for that? I'm guessing it's different for each company that you advise. Yeah, it, it definitely is different for each company. Although I think in general, you know, uh, it's never like, it's never more than a couple hours a month, um, you know, in, in a, in a non-paid advisory capacity. Yes. So Jacob, you're, you're in Cleveland right now, correct? Cleveland, Ohio. I'm looking out at Lake Erie right now. What's like the tech startup scene there, like the software development scene there like? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's, um, it's it's somewhat under the radar, but there are a fair amount of um, you know uh, tech startups here. Um, the, I think that the Midwest and, and Cleveland, and I say the Midwest in general, um, there's just a little different mentality than there is on the coast around startups. Um, and I think there's good and bad to that. I think that um, there's a little more pragmatism, uh, and and you know. My, my conversations with investors, a lot of times, um, investors on the coast, we look at uh, companies here, they look at founders who are like, I can, you know, be a million dollars in two years. And they're like, I want a founder who's going to be like, I'm going to be a billion dollars in two years, right? Yes. And indeed. so there's that, that, that pragmatism versus swinging for the fences, kind of like just different mentalities. And so, um, you know, I, I think, culturally that that's just something a little different in the midwest but um i think we have a healthy healthy startup scene here you know i interact with with um you know uh founders on a regular basis so the the, the startups in cleveland when they raise money are there, is there vcs and angels in the cleveland area they can go to or they have to go out of town like to chicago new york or the, or the bay area to raise funds so there's like there's like like funds there to, to go after there's a mix, right? So we have some some local organizations, um, some angel groups that um, kind of come together and, and invest in early stage. Uh, the state actually has some programs where they do some like matching funds for private investment. Um, and, and so that helps as well. Um, so there are some organizations here that help with, with um, early stage investment. There's also like in Columbus, which is, you know, a couple hours from us, uh, you know, there, there's a, a firm there that um, Mark Kwame came from, from the Valley, came here, started a firm focused on the Midwest, right? So bringing that kind of coastal VC mentality to Ohio. Um, so, so there's a mix, but I think a lot of times when it gets to a, a bigger round, um, when you're talking more than like a a couple million dollar round, a lot of places, a lot of folks go outside of Ohio to raise. Yes. So Jacob, you're coming to MGNEO, MGNEO won the Ohio Business Magazine Best Workplace recently. Can you talk about that? Or was, was it something like someone nominated you for, or you, it was a contest you entered, or how did that come about and how did you win that? 
Yeah, so it was an employee nomination. So um, one, one of our employees uh, submitted a nomination um, and you know they reached out and we filled out some, provided them some information and, and we won. Um, so you know, we won a few awards that way, um, but that, that's the most recent. And as a company, what's the benefit of getting that dispute publicity? Or you have you have to recruit talent. What's the benefit for you as a company when those things happen to your company? Yeah, I, th I think publicity is probably the main one. Um, we we certainly kind of tout it when we're talking to um, people we're looking to hire. You know, it's a you know a bullet point on the list of things that you mentioned. Um, so I, I mean, I think really there's no work that goes into that, right? It's, it's more of a, a recognition of what we've done, right? We're a culture-driven organization. And so um, I think that it's just really recognition that, that we've done a good job with that. So Jacob, at your company, you have something called CTO as a service offering, I believe. Can you talk about that and what it entails? Yeah, yeah. So that came about because We've, um, through our history, we've worked with a lot of startups. So we work with anybody from a startup to a Fortune 500 company. Um, and, and a lot of times when we work with a startup, it, it tends to be, you know, a non-technical founder who needs someone to help them build their initial version of a, of a technical product, right? So we're doing um, their, what we call a minimum viable product or MVP. And so when we do that initial development, what we found with non-technical founders, especially when they want to go raise money, is um, investors want to see someone technical at the table so they have confidence that, that the founders can be able to take this to market and get it there and do it right. And um, they're not in a position yet to have you know, a full-time CTO, nor do they really need one, right? So what they need is the hands-on development help, but um, finding someone strategic who can play that um, CTO role in front of investors and to help provide that technical vision was missing. And so um, because of that, we said, you know what, we can do this kind of fractional CTO offering where for, you know, a, a, a day a week or, you know, for a few thousand dollars a month, we can provide that technical vision. We can help them find their first technical hire. Um, we can kind of coach that person so that, you know, they'll be able to take over that, that senior technical leader role. And so um, we saw that gap, we put that offering out, we've done it a few times um, for startups where, you know, they, they have this need for um, that senior technical resource, but, but they don't have the budget or necessarily the need for them to be full time. And so that's what that offering is. Yeah, I think a lot of like non-technical founders like myself had to learn the lesson the hard way, right? You're like, do you really need a CTO or do you need like someone to put in work in code, right? Do you need a yeah. CTO? And then like, like I'm in the Seattle area and people are like, oh, this develops everywhere. Well, actually does not, right? Because I can't afford to pay the developer Amazon salaries, Microsoft salaries. And then the yeah. people coming to code academies right out of college, like they don't have the skills to do what you needed to do, right? So it's very hard to find tech talent. It's, it's a challenge like being a non tech founder trying to build a tech company, right? So I think yeah, it's a great absolutely. service you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you know, that's a, that's a great, um, you know, it's an astute observation, right? You've got those two ends of the spectrum. The, the really um, experienced folks who you can't necessarily afford as, as a founder and uh, the junior folks who really need some oversight, right? And that's, that's one of the things that we, we coach those more junior folks who, who wanna be kind of in on the ground floor and doing that development, but need some oversight and support. That's one of the things we do in that offering. So from my experience dealing with tech people, like if you're a junior developer, it's really hard to find a job, right? It's like, it's that like crazy to find a job as a junior developer. Now senior developers, they switch jobs, you know, almost daily seems like, right? But as a junior developer trying to get your foot in the door, what advice do you have for junior developers to get the first position? Yeah, so I think um, th there's there's a number of things, but I think that the developers that have more success are the ones who um, have more on their resume than just a uh, you know a degree where they went through and got their degree in computer science or computer engineering and and you know the the school related projects. But if they have a you know, a GitHub account that has their own side projects where they've gone and done some exploration and shown that they write good code, they're proud of their code, they're putting it out there for people to see. I think those developers get snapped up pretty quickly. Yeah, and like, this might be a wrong approach, but I'll tell people like, I don't know anything about code or developing, I know the basics. 
But if I can look at GitHub and see like certain number of commits, I don't know if the code's good or not, what it even is, but I have to presume that you're you know trying to hone your craft right. Yeah. If you have, if you have more commits on there. Yeah, absolutely, right. So, so you as, as someone who who may not look at the code itself. You're looking at that and saying, well, at least this person is is doing something there. That's a almost like a, a gate in your as you're going through that process. Yes. So next question. So, and I ask all I ask tech people this all the time. So in my mind, between tech people and not tech, there's like a communication disconnect, right? So example, if I ask like we'll say a regular person, right? I tell you know a person, regular person, go go open the door. They'll get up, go open the door. But tech person, you got to say, hey, get up at your chair take a 90 degree angle, take a 60 degree this, you know, turn the door, this amount of torque, you know, this detail, detail, detail. And I think there's a lot of, you know, confusing when a non-tech person tells the tech person they want and a non-tech person. So who's, is it responsible for the non-tech person to like detail by detail, explain what they want, or for the tech person be saying, hey, non-tech person, like I need more detail. Cause I think there's a lot of confusion and disconnect on that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. And I think it really depends on a number of things, right? So when you're talking to, so like we, we've had the experience where people work with offshore and they have to write like very, very, very detailed requirements, right? Where they're going to the nth level of degree to the point where like the, the only thing they're not doing is writing the code yeah. because every other possible th consideration is dealt with, right? And the nice there's a lot of, and the night tech person like, this is what I hired you for, right? I don't have time for this. What am exactly, I doing? Exactly. So, so, you know, I think part of that is just uh, uh, an organizational design um, component, right? So you have to have the type of people, and, and I put myself in this category. I kind of live in the, at the intersection of business and technology, where I understand both sides. I can communicate to both sides. And um, you have to design your organization where you have someone who can, um, grow your tech people to, to um, one, understand that there's a certain amount of that that they need to do. And when they're not clear on things, they should bring them up or ask for detail or explain why they need detail, right? Because a lot of times it's, hey, there are these exception scenarios that aren't covered in what you told me, right? You said go answer the door, but you know there's two doors and I don't know which one's being knocked on, right? Um, and most of the time it's that one over there, right? Like, I don't know, I'm just trying to use your analogy, but, but like the, the, the point being is like, there are, when you're writing software, like there's all kinds of exceptions that you have to account for. And so sometimes it's about asking questions to get the detail for how to handle those. But unfortunately, a lot of developers aren't great at communicating. And so you just hear, I need more detail and not, here's why I need the detail here's the things I'm thinking about or the problem I'm trying to solve that you weren't thinking about, right? You, so, so there's, I think there's a, a, a lot of value in having the right people in the organization that can sit in the middle, train the developers how to communicate the right way, how to understand what the business person wants, um, as well as train, you know, the business people to understand, you know, what the develop, like how developers think. And so I think there's there's a, a merger there. I think when I've run projects, um, a lot of times I have developers in the business meeting so they can understand and, and um, see what is trying to be accomplished because then they're so much more effective when they write their code. So Jacob, when a startup founder, not tech, you know, is looking like bring on like software development, there's a lot of options, right? They can like learn the code themselves, then go to India, the Philippines, Ukraine, Fiverr, Upwork, you know, um, hire an extra developer, hire a company like yours, all these options. Can you talk to some of them what's like good options, bad options? I, I, like, I know it depends on the situation and all, but just your general opinion on that. Sure. Um, so, so obviously I'm biased, right? <laughs> um, so I'll put that out up front, but like my experience with offshore has not been good. And there are a couple of key reasons why I feel like it's not been good. Um, we've done a bunch of rescue projects where you know, someone has gone offshore and they come back and they like, hey, we had this developed and it doesn't work how we expected to and it's a big mess. Can you fix it? And we have to start over because of any number of reasons of what was wrong with it. But um, when you go offshore, especially if you go offshore because of the low cost, a lot of times you, you aren't thinking about the uh, cultural differences that 
that may mean that the people aren't thinking about things the way you're expecting them to think about them, right? They may not use things the same way. There, there's a communication gap, there's a time zone difference. There's all these things that can impact uh, the effectiveness of, of a team. Um, and so my experience is what suffers there is quality, functionality, um, and timeliness of delivery. Um, you know, pe people tell me that, that I kind of lump everybody into the same bucket there, but that's my experience, right? Um, I think that what it comes down to in, in terms of the other options are like, what are you comfortable doing, right? Like if you're a super scrappy founder who, you know, you're building a tech product and, and you really want to get in there and know it, and you're willing to spend a little extra time, hey, there's probably some value in, in self-teaching at least some of it, getting a little exposure. And then um, after you've done that, maybe go find someone, whether that's a freelancer or a developer that you're gonna hire full-time. Um, you know, we, a company like mine um, is, is really a good place to go if you know you don't have the expertise, you wanna focus on the business um, defining the functionality, the vision, raising money, selling, and not being in the weeds. We're a great partner because you can come to us, you can explain what you're trying to accomplish. We can work with you to get there. We partner with our customers. You know, some companies like mine um, will we'll partner with you, we'll, not, not in a, a financial sense where we're taking equity, but in, in the sense of like, we view like your success is our success, right? We're, we're building this alongside you. And so in that scenario, that can be really valuable to, to a founder who's, who's trying to get something to market but doesn't understand the details and doesn't want to. Um, it just depends on, on what, what kind of experience you want, I guess. When companies use you as a, like a fractional CTO, do you find that they like put you or the person working the CTO on the pitch deck as a company CTO? How does that work? Always. Yeah, always. I mean, that's, that's part of the value, right? To be able to say, hey, if you have questions about our technical vision or, or how we're going to accomplish this or what technology is needed, like this is the guy who can you can talk to. And we'll, and we'll go to pitch meetings, too, if, if that's needed. OK. Um, what What's your advice to like startup founders who are looking for tech talent? How does he go about doing that? Yeah, I think uh, um, it depends on where you are in the cycle. If you're looking to hire, right, um, and you have a leader, I am a big proponent of, of hiring younger, right? Like, it's easy to say, I'm going to go hire someone with experience because I won't need to, like, oversee them as much. Um, and, and that's true. But, like, as a founder, right, you're, 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 you're managing uh, cash flow and things are tight and you can afford someone um, more junior, who's likely going to be hungrier and more yes. ambitious and more willing to, to like go the extra mile to get things done versus, you know, someone who, um, who's been out there, who's done it, who's got maybe got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, maybe got, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a family who they're, you know, going to be uh, competing with uh, their time, right? So in that scenario, I think for specifically for, you know, a, a startup environment, I think there's a lot of value in going with a more junior resource, knowing the, the risks that come with that, like, hey, they may screw something up, but they're also going to spend as much time as you need to fix it because they're hungry and ambitious and excited about what they're doing. So let's say there's a junior developer out there and they have two job offers, one from a startup that's this got an A round, you know, got, got lots of funding and a company like, let's say, Microsoft or Amazon, what job should they take? That, that's a, it depends on that individual and what they want, right? Those are two different types of people. Um, and so, like, uh, you know, there are folks who work for me. I'll, I'll just give you an example of, of people who work for me and people who work for one of my customers, right? Um, one of my customers is Moen. Um, they make faucets. We've helped them with their um, connected faucet. And, you know, we're a, a, a small uh, boutique software development firm. Um, the people who work for me don't ever want to work for a large corporate environment where there's bureaucracy and there's, you know, they may make a little more money um, there. They may uh, have, you know, uh, a, a more um, nine to five type lifestyle sometimes, 
that really depends on the environment, but um, there's corporate environment and then there's startup environment. And it's really a, what kind of culture do you want to live in? Because those don't cross over, it's one or the other. Yeah, like I have a good friend, like during college, he was like working for startups, a CTO a couple of times. And then he got a job at Microsoft and he literally like does like one code a day, right? For Microsoft, right? But it, it fits his lifestyle now. He gets to travel, do different things. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just different, different animal, I think. Yeah, but it's a different it's a different point in his life, right? Yes, he definitely is. Yeah, yeah. So Jacob, uh, you had a company before called I think Spiral Sano that did we say didn't make it. Can you talk about why it didn't make it? Any lessons learned you can pass on to us? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the the number one uh, lesson is that company we started in parallel with Mgenio. So I had both companies at the same time, and and so lesson number one is especially early on in your company life cycle, you got to focus, right? You got to focus on, on what you're doing and you can't do two thing, two companies at the same time. It's just, uh, it's, it's a really hard proposition. Um, and, and that company was very different as well, right? So Ingenio, we do custom software development. Um, we're a service business. Um, that was a product business. So uh, Spirosana was a, it was a chronic condition management platform for, um, for hospitals and uh, managed care organizations. Uh, and you, know, the, you gotta understand the industry you're in and what the sales cycles are and what it's gonna take, um, like how much cash flow you need, right? So um, the sales cycles in healthcare are really long Right, like even after you get the verbal, like, yep, we want to go with your product, you got to get through legal and through IT review and all the things that, that you have to go through in a hospital. I mean, we were um, in talks with multiple hospitals for over a year where two of them had said, yep, we want to use you, but there was still another six months in the process. And that's, a, you know, so, so managing the, the cash there is, is, and understanding what that timeline looks like is really important. And I would say the third thing is, um, so I had a partner and at the end of the day, we were chasing different rabbits. Um, you know, uh, I'm very pragmatic by nature. Um, and I looked at that company and I looked at that industry, right? So, uh, the, the healthcare industry, the, the market we were in, and I said, we're going to hit a certain amount of traction and we're going to get bought by a bigger player because I'm looking across the landscape and that's what's happening across the board all the players who were competitors or similar to us were getting bought by, by the big players. And that's how innovation was happening at the larger organizations. We're at a partner who was like, this is gonna be a multi-billion dollar business. Um, and so like, you, how do you rectify those two things, right? Um, it's just a different, we're chasing different rabbits. And so I think being on the same page with your partners is really important. Um, understanding, uh, kind of what that looks like and what that uh, progression is going to be is is uh, key to it working. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes people realize how, how like difficult it is to be a startup or a small business owner, but sometimes I think we forget how much, how, how many things have to align up correctly, right? Like right employees, right this, right that, you know, and there's so many things and one little thing goes off scouting, it's like the business fails, right? I think people don't get that sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're in, you know, and not to mention like the, the, uh, the stress associated with with that kind of stuff is is is, you know, it's it's a, a heavy weight to carry. Yeah, and I talk about this a lot too. Like, you know, you might have a, a, a have a startup, have people working for you for quote unquote free for equity, right? But you know, after six months, eight months, you know, they got to find a real job, right? And they leave you, and then you're starting back from ground zero, right? Yeah, yeah. So, Jacob, can you define Internet of Things? What is what is that? Sure. So Internet of Things, the most common understanding of it is smart home, right? Uh, products like Nest, Thermostat, um, a Philips Hue light bulb, things that you can um, control remotely, uh, you know, that, that uh, are, um, you know, things that are, you know, in your house, usually sensor driven or um, or, or connected to an app or to, to the internet that lets you um, control them, right? So at its core, right, it's, it's a thing that's connected to the internet that is, would typically not be in, in a legacy 
kind of environment not be connected. Um, the, the Nest thermostat and the Philips Hue light bulb are probably the two most common, but there are a ton of those now, and it is a an area that is growing rapidly. I, I mentioned, you know, Moen, you know, they launched a, a smart faucet where you can talk to it. You can say, you know, Alexa, turn on my, my faucet or Alexa, give me two tablespoons of water at 100 degrees, and it can do that. Um, today, I think Internet of Things is very focused on convenience. Um, I think as, as things move forward, it'll become more valuable, integrated, and will be focused on things like um, preventative maintenance, like, hey, my, you know, my air conditioning condenser um, is doing this. And so that means I'm going to need a service call in the next month. Let me get that out of the way now by having my air conditioner call my service person and schedule them. I don't even need to be involved other than, you know, approving the bill, that kind of thing. Jacob, so there's this deep tech, uh, blockchain, um, AI, VR, AR, autonomous vehicles, of all this like quote unquote new technology going on, what, what, what's exciting to you the most? Um, well, so we live in this IoT space. Um, and so there's some cool stuff happening there that's really exciting to me. Um, that kind of next generation of it where things are more connected and, and um, providing kind of deeper value is pretty interesting to me. Um, so Amazon um, announced not too long ago, um, Amazon Sidewalk, which is their uh, like a 900 megahertz spectrum connectivity solution that should allow for low cost connectivity for things that aren't necessarily within your Wi-Fi range. So I'm kind of excited about that because there are lots of things that you can imagine that you might not have like in your house necessarily, but could be valuable to be connected. Um, but it's outside of the range of, of Wi-Fi. And so you, with cellular, you have a cost challenge and um, this could be this, that middle ground that with that 900 megahertz spectrum um, could be a, a game changer in that sense. Um, so that's one thing that's interesting to me. Um, blockchain is, is, uh, is pretty interesting as well. Um, more kind of, so we did a project a couple years ago it was, it was a, a Bitcoin wallet and that was my first kind of like deep dive into that space. Um, you know, probably the best business decision I've made was to accept Bitcoin as payment um, in that scenario um, and, and not sell it because now it's worth a lot more than it was then. But uh, I think it's a powerful technology. I think we're still in that phase of figuring out what to do with it. So Jacob, put on your feature tech genie hat. Do you think we're at the point where all of us have like little microchips in our finger somewhere and everything runs off of that? Or is that, is that fantasy science fiction fantasy? So I think that uh, that's more of a culture question and a, a, a you know, a adoption question than it is a technology question. The technology to allow for that, certainly. Certainly, I know there's a company in Sweden that does that already. Either Sweden or Norway already does that. All their employees have a chip, and they run everything off the chip for the company. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, so so there, you know, it's more of a question of what people are willing to to do, and and you know, this gets into some of that like question around like privacy and like you know uh, data and what data is my data versus you know free for whoever, whether that be. Google or Facebook or, you know, insert large tech company to take and profit off of, right? Like there's, there's some um, really kind of heavy uh, discussions there. And I think when you get into that next layer, it's just even more, right? So you're going to be tracking me as my employer with this chip and, you know, like what I do on the weekend, you're going to be yeah. testing my blood through that. Like, like what is like, <laughs> I know, you know, there's, yeah. there's, there's it's, a lot it's of definitely, of, definitely a slippery slope, you know, but I, I'm sure some people are like, you know, you track me on my phone or anyway, let me get rid of the phone and put the chip in my hand, you know, like, you know, there's no privacy anyway, just track me, you know, but other people are like, no, no, don't track me. Right. Right. Well, I, you know, I was talking to someone um, and I think there's, there's definitely a, a steady erosion of privacy concerns with younger generations um, because I was talking to someone who was saying that they were talking to their daughter who's, uh, you know, like a freshman in high school. And he said, you know, he was talking about how he, he was turning off the tracking that Google does. And she's like, 
you're going to get ads anyways. Wouldn't you want them to be relevant? Like all that's doing is giving you relevant ads. And so it's just a different mindset, right? Yeah. His mindset was, Hey, don't I, like, like, I don't want you to like know what I'm doing because then you're going to, you know, know what I'm doing. Like that's my private, like, you know, web searching. And she's saying, yeah, but like, what's it matter? They're just giving you what you want versus random stuff. Yeah, that's, I never thought about it from that point of view. That, that's a good point, though, when you think about it like that. Yeah, yeah so privacy I think there's... Di privacy different different now than even 10 years ago. Absolutely. So, Jacob, talk about your, your company now, Imgenio. Like, how it came about? What, how's it, what's it going with it right now? What's your vision for it? Sure. Yeah, so, so you know, I kind of grew up in the consulting world. Um, so doing custom software development, um, in, in one form or another for a number of companies up until um, I started MGNEO. And when I started MGNEO, our initial focus was gonna be mobile development. We were only gonna do mobile apps and mobile web. Um, that was, I had some good expertise in that. We had done some, some really cool stuff early on when the iPhone first launched. And so um, that was what we were gonna do. And that lasted like a day. Because when you first start out, hey, revenue is revenue and you got to get paid. And so someone came and said, hey, can you do this project? I'm like, yep, we can do that. Uh, it's not mobile, but we'll figure that out later, right? Um, now we've gotten to the point where um, we do custom software development, mobile cloud and IoT. Um, those are our niches. Um, we, will, we, we will turn down projects now. We're, we're at a point where we can be a little more selective and it can be a good fit. Um, so we'll turn down projects if they're not a good fit or they don't fit in our niche and we'll refer out to people. We have a lot of relationships where we refer to other people. Um, but all of our businesses come through um, either referrals or partnerships. So I've kind of developed my network over time. And so people I've worked with who know me, know what we're doing. They'll call me and say, hey, I've got someone who needs this. And like, yeah, we can do that. And so that's how a lot of our businesses come. Um, so when I look at like where we're headed, um, we'll probably start looking for um, to scale outside of that, just referral and partnership model um, and look for some growth uh, into, into other markets, um, other, I guess, regional markets, if you will. Um, and then, uh, you know, when it comes to technology, we have our, our kind of core niches, but we'll also look at, you know, are there, are there natural extensions of those, um, you know, the, the, the adjacent technologies that are an obvious kind of like next step for us to move into. And I'm not expecting to stay just those three. Like I think as we are really good at new technology, um, as new technologies come out and, and they, um, get to the point where we think they're mature enough that we can offer them and they make sense for our skill set, we'll, we'll move into those as well. Jacob, from your point of view, who is your perfect customer? My perfect customer. So my perfect customer is someone who um, they, they need uh, software. They don't have the expertise to build it themselves. They're looking for someone to come in help them develop the first uh, iteration of it or the first couple iterations of it um, and then transition it to them or manage it long-term. But, um, but really they wanna develop something new, um, ideally something that's somewhat innovative where I can bring the expertise that we have and um, you know, help them you know, launch a new product with that expertise. Um, and then you know lay out a vision for them to run with it, whether that's with or without us in the future. So Jacob, you, you, you talked about this a little bit just a minute ago, but your company has a good amount of growth recently. I know you have your first partners. How did that growth come about? Like, yeah, so I think some of that's just been you know we've been around long enough that you know early on you know we had a few projects, and then you know um, those customers were happy and they continued to give us work and then um, we got more projects and it's just kind of slowly built. And then, it, you know, at some point you get a little bit of a flywheel. Um, but I think the biggest contributor to that growth was as we, um, as we got to the point where we were um, delivering for, you know, small to medium sized companies, some really high value stuff 
uh, that was then being seen by some, some of our um, partners and they were able to bring us into big customers. And so, um, you know, working with a Cardinal Health or a Moen or a Carter Lumber came after we've kind of been around for say five years and had demonstrated our, our capabilities um, on a smaller scale. And so I think that we, we just kind of reached that threshold. And are your clients mainly in Ohio or you're across the United States? We're across the United States, but the majority of them are in Ohio. So next, talk about advice for entrepreneurs to get started out. Yeah. So, uh, so prepare yourself, right? Like as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur prepare yourself. It, it's, it's, a, it's a roller coaster. Um, so, so that's number one. Um, and I, I talked about it earlier, focus. I think focus is really important early on. I think as entrepreneurs, it's easy to, um, oh, squirrel, squirrel, right? Like shiny object syndrome is, is inherent in, in, the, um, in that role. And so you have to really focus and, and be able to like acknowledge, right? Like, cause I, 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 get, I get distracted by things too, right? Like, hey, that could be a really good opportunity. And you have to really focus and say, okay, it is what it is. Like, is it the direction that we want to go in or are we on a path that we want to well, stick with? Yeah. Um, because I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs go this way, I'll, we'll pivot, right? And, and you know, the, the idea of the pivot has been kind of romanticized, uh, I think, you know, in startup culture where, you know, you should only pivot if you fail in your initial direction, right? Um, so, so there's that kind of, uh, I think, dichotomy there in terms of how pivots are talked about and what they really are intended for. So I think focus and, and managing kind of what, what path you're on um, is, is really important. And then the last thing I would say is, um, I think it's really important. I mean, I know I've felt this way to find the people you trust, uh, you know, that you can bounce things off of, that you can um, trust their advice um, because those people are the ones that are gonna be your sounding board. Um, and you're gonna need a sounding board because entrepreneurship can be a lonely path um, you have to put on a happy face for your customers. You have to put on a happy face for your employees. You got to find those people that you can, you know, confide in like, Hey, I don't feel great. I'm nervous about this, or I'm, I'm worried about cash flow. I'm, you know, all these things that come up that, that you can't share with the people that are depending on you to pay them or the people that are paying you. So I think that's a, an important thing. I think a lot of founders get wrong about chase revenue streams. They might chase the revenue stream and it might bring them money and stuff, but what's the cost like? So it, it, you bring a revenue stream in, but it delays your focus for too much, right? It takes off target too much, right? And the, and the cost of that, I think, I think it's worth more than the revenue stream, I think sometimes. Yeah, and I, I think it's really important to like, at least step back and acknowledge that, right? Um, what are we sacrificing when we take this revenue stream, right? Does it keep the lights on so we can do our, our thing? Well, maybe then it's worth it. Uh, does it. Does it bring us money that, then, you know, just delays us and, and we don't have any, you know, additional runway, then it's probably not worth it. And I think that's a really important point to understand what you're getting if you're going to do that. Jacob, how do you find your tech talent? How do you do it yourself? How do you bring in new developers for your company? What's your method for that? Sure. Yeah. So I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier um, around, you know, the value of, of hiring younger folks. Um, uh, we hire for attitude and aptitude. And when I say that, it's um, attitude is really around culture fit. And, you know, um, we, we uh, like no assholes, no prima donnas, like you have to be kind of down to earth and fit with kind of our culture. Uh, you know, that's that's one really important piece. The other piece is, is aptitude, which is you're able to do it um, from a, you have that foundational tech knowledge, you, um, can learn things quick enough to be able to get up to speed. You take feedback and can collaborate so you can learn from others. Um, that's the aptitude side of it. And if you have those two things, um, we'll get you there with the rest of it. And so we hire younger, um, less experienced, but really smart people who um, you know, are excited about the things they're gonna be doing. Um, and we've seen a lot, lot of success with that. Um, 
both in my company and prior to uh, starting Ingenio, I, I used that exact same model uh, for a large consulting firm that opened a technology center in Cleveland. Over two years, I hired 50 people uh, and using that exact model, ton of success. They then continued that after I left, hired another 100 people over the next few years. Um, they were just bought by Salesforce. Nice. So for Ingenio, do you just focus on a certain, uh, like a limited amount of coding languages or you do all of them or how does that work? So, uh, you know, we are technology agnostic in that we will use whatever the right technology is for a given product, right? Like, so if someone needs something done, we'll look at it and say, well, you know, maybe this isn't our preferred language to work in or our preferred tech stack to work in, but that's the right thing for that. Um, so, so at, at its core, we're, we're agnostic. We'll use whatever makes sense um, that delivers on what what's needed. Um, there are some technologies we're just not versed in that we'll refer. If, if someone's like, I need this done in Python or I need this done in .NET, um, a lot of times we'll refer that to, to folks that we've worked with in the past that we know will do a good job for them just because we don't have the people that have that core expertise. How often do you still code? Uh, I, I, if I'm coding, there's a big problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was never the best coder. My, my strength was always in the bigger picture, the architecture, um, poking holes in things or, or helping solve the problem, but not writing the code itself. So if I get into code, it's because either there's a big hole or I'm doing something I shouldn't be. <laughs> Great answer. Um, Jacob, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm not really active on social other than LinkedIn, um, but you can find me on LinkedIn pretty easily. Jacob Glenn, um, it's MGNEO. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find there. So for developers, I mean, I think there's like there's Hacker News or GitHub, like other things like that. What 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 like material or magazines or whatever you want to call it should developers be on like 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 the like network, hone their craft, or how you want to call it? Yeah, I think some some of that depends on you know what what they want to develop on, right? Like, so, it, you know, I, I've got some folks who really like working with Google products, right? And so they're working with things on Firebase and Google Cloud Platform. And so, uh, you know, they're looking at Google conferences and, and the Google newsletters. I think, you know, um, I have some other folks who are, are more on the Amazon stack. And so um, they're doing, you know, the Amazon reInvent things and, and the Amazon newsletters. But I think the key is just um, getting out um, whatever stack you want to get on, whoever's kind of the, like if it's Google, make sure you're just seeing the announcements. And then, you know, these companies are so big now that, you know, an announcement from Google about new products, find the ones that are relevant to you, dig deeper, look at what the, the, the product managers in those spaces are saying and just kind of stay out in front of it. Um, and I think that the biggest thing I would say for developers is to try to understand what is, um, hey, this is new spaghetti being thrown at the wall and may not be around a year from now versus what is really starting to get traction. It's a hard thing to kind of filter through, especially early in your career, but um, don't don't go deep on something that may not be here next year. Jacob, so is there a real difference between Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud Platform, Firebase, or Sure, Rackspace, et cetera, et cetera? Are they all basically do the same thing, just in minor different ways? Yeah, so that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think that the the that uh, the big three, so uh, AWS, Google Cloud Platform, and Azure. Um, have similar offerings. They do things a little different ways. AWS is the, the biggest one. They have the most offerings. Um, Google and Azure both are, are pretty competitive with them though. Um, so I don't think there's like a, a fundamental difference. Um, you go down to like, um, you know, Rackspace and, and some of the hosting providers, they're just providing servers. I think that the main difference is if you look at the evolution of, of of hosting, um, what like AWS and Google and, and Microsoft are doing is they're moving to this serverless world. Um, when we do cloud development, that's where we focus is on serverless. And serverless basically just means 
an event-driven architecture, you're paying for um, like, if you have a web service, instead of paying for a web server to be on 24 seven to handle all your requests for that web service, you're just paying for like a millionth of a cent when you execute that web service. So it's event driven. Um, and and that's, that's kind of the paradigm where I think everything's headed. And I think those three providers are the ones who are really doing that. Is it safe to presume if you learn one of them, you can learn all the rest of them? I'm a firm believer that you can learn all of them. I think learning them isn't hard. The concepts are basically the same, but they do do things different ways. And you're going to spend some time on Stack Overflow or Google or wherever trying to find answers to the weird things that are happening that you're not expecting because they do things a little different. So do any of them like support like different tech stacks better or worse? Or does that, does that even matter? Um, so, I, you know, I think that, uh, you know, Microsoft supports .NET. Um, they're they're the like you know you're not going to deploy in in like a Lambda function on AWS uh, .NET code. You're going to deploy um, you know Node.js or TypeScript or Python, right? Like so so like yes and no, I guess is the short answer to that question. Okay, so let's suppose there's a developer listening to this podcast and they want to come work for you. How would they get your attention? What would they need to do? Because like, hey, Jacob. I don't know if you have a job yet or not, but I want to like get on your radar and, you know, a possibly work for you in the future. What do they need to do? What, what, what can they do? Yeah. So I think, I, I mean, uh, the, the simplest thing is just reach out, right? Like reach out, um, especially if they're local, right? Reach out, have a conversation, tell me about themselves, right? Um, and, and why they're interested. I, I, you know, we're, we're always looking for good people. And so um, I think, you know, making a, a good impression through reaching out and connecting to me or to any of the people that work for me, right? Um, I've had, we've hired people because they reached out to someone on my team, built a little bit of a relationship there over some, you know, similar tech interest. And then that just evolved into us hiring them over time. So um, I think reaching out, connecting, kind of understanding where there's some uh, shared interest is a good starting point. Jake, we're kind of coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Oh, man. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, well, hopefully what I've talked about has been helpful. But I think, you know, beyond that, I think uh, if if anybody listening is, is building a product, um, this is kind of fresh for me, so I'll just share it. I think that there's a lot of value in... Um, as you're building products, focus on the core promise. I, I mentioned that earlier and, and um, simplicity over complexity is, is valuable. And I think that's getting lost sometimes today um, with the ability to add all these different features to things. Jacob, thanks, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This has been fun. And to our listeners, thank you, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.